Hello everyone, welcome to Relationship Talk with Sharonda. Of course, I am Sharonda and I am your host and we are going to get off into our segment about comprehensive sex education. It is back to school time, so I personally felt like this was the best time to dive deep into sex education. We're going to talk about some of everything, but before we can get off into that lesson, we have to get off into the foundation. Why do we feel the way we feel about sex? Why do we have a certain attitude towards sex? And the thing is, we all have an attitude towards sex, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, whether you're kind of indifferent and neutral, we all have an attitude, right? So how did this develop? Most of us formed our attitudes about sex um, from our families, our peers, our community, our church, teachers, mentors, just the people that are in our life that help raise us up. Now, this is the crazy part because just because you may have had one point of view your whole life, you could have become an adult, got introduced to new information, and now that point of view has changed or is currently changing. And that's fine too, right? But we all have an attitude towards sex. I tend to be more on the sex positive side. And when I went and I thought about my life overall, I can honestly say that I have always been sex positive. I came from more of what you would consider a blended family background, meaning that I think I've shared this with you all before. Some people are practically just raised by their mom or their mom and their dad, right? And they may have had a little help here and there along the way. Me, on the other hand, I was raised by the village, meaning I was raised by my mom. I was raised by several grandparents. I had a host of aunts and uncles, um, cousins, a lot of teachers, uh, mentors. I just had a lot of people around me that poured into me. And all of them told me something different. Right. But I took what I felt like was the meat and I did what I tell everyone to do. Spit out the bones. Right. So um, I had a mom who was very logical. She was way ahead of her time, like way ahead of her time. Most women back in those days didn't move like she moved in the world. They didn't think the way that she thought. And they damn sure didn't say the stuff that she said. Right. So I had a mom that was very uh, I'm just going to say she was way ahead of her time, right? And for me, that was actually an advantage because the, the version of Sharonda that you see today is directly related from, from this woman imparting herself into me, right? Um, I had a grandmother who was very religious, Southern Baptist, went to church every Sunday, sang in the choir, went to work like everybody else did, and she had a very, very negative outlook on sex, right? Then I had another grandmother who was college educated with a master's degree, who, who was um, a believer, but she did not faithfully attend church, but she was very practical in her approach, and she was very sex positive. OK, and then I had two other grandmothers who were basically heavily into church and they didn't have an opinion about it at all because it was never brought up. So I really don't know how they felt about it because it was never a conversation that we had. But for my other two grandmothers, there were actually conversations and one of them was extremely negative. One was extremely positive And my mama was just extremely realistic. OK, so with that being said, um, when I started blogging today on my page, the one thing I wanted everyone to take into consideration is the time period, right? What was going on when I was developing? Okay. This was during the time when the only computers you saw were at the schools and at the libraries. If you had a computer at your home, you was considered to be probably well off. The average person, even though we were very comfortable growing up, we did not have a computer in our house. We didn't. Um, the internet that we have today 
did not exist. The computer was literally used to do uh, reports, almost similar to a word processor. Uh, you could play a few little games on there. It had an up, down, left, right button. Like, when I say simplified, I think we may have been doing, um, I can't even think of the program. It might have been DOS or RAM or something. But it was very simplified and it was nothing like what we have today, right? When I got in high school, they had something called X Jeeves. And you can literally get online and ask Jeeves any question and Jeeves will answer the question or whatever. That was the first time that I can honestly say outside of going to a library, I had access to information, right? Prior to that, all of the information that I got was the information I got from the church, the information I got from my family, what I got from my community, right? But by the time I got to high school, I had more access but the thing was, it wasn't necessarily always available to me. So when you did use the computer and you were at the library, a lot of times you was researching whatever you had to research to do whatever uh, project or report you were doing. Why? Because somebody else was in line to use the computer right behind you. So you didn't get a chance to just search things for your own leisure or your own pleasure. That just wasn't the time period that we lived in, right? So we didn't have a lot of access to information. I went to school. My school had a clinic. Pretty much the only thing I knew about the clinic at the school was a lot of girls went to see if they were pregnant. Um, and they treated like really minor stuff, but most people that I knew you, that utilized the clinic was going for pregnancy tests. But yet I don't remember my school having any type of a uh, comprehensive sex education outside of uh, when they teach reproduction and health. Right. Uh, I even thought about our school had a daycare. Our school had a bus with car seats on it, but yet there was still no sex education. When I thought about the church, I thought about the people who were in my age group. I got married very young. I've told y'all several times that I was married before I graduated high school. So that explains just how young I was when I got married. I never dealt with any shame in regards to being pregnant because I was married, right? However, a lot of my peers that got pregnant were not married. So that means that if they were in the choir, if they was on the usher board or on the drill team or participating in any type of auxiliary that the church had, they now had to remove themselves from the auxiliary and they had to sit at the very back of the church on the last row because they were pregnant out of wedlock. They were having premarital sex, fornicating, and the evidence was the baby. And on the back row was a lot of young teenage girls. And what I always thought to myself was, why isn't there a space for the boys? I've never seen a boy being sat down in church behind a pregnancy. Only the girls, right? Right? And then once you have your baby and you wanted to get back into whatever the auxiliary, auxiliary was that you wanted to do, you simply had to go up to the altar and confess your sins to everybody and let them know that you were sorry and apologize to your family and apologize to God. And at that point, you were welcome back into the fold. But if you never did that, then you never got to participate in the auxiliaries again. I thought about um, my community and what resources were available. Um, back then, most girls were part of Planned Parenthood at the health unit. Um, I remember just because I had gotten my period, I was put on birth control. And my grandfather was livid. Very upset. He didn't see the purpose of it. Um, however, my mom was a teen parent with me. And she got married very young too, even though she didn't stay married very long. And I think that that was just a way of her trying to prevent me from going down the same road that she went down. Um, but this is the thing about birth control. A lot of people put their kids on birth control as a preventive um, method, right? 
but they don't necessarily have conversations with them around sex. Meaning the young girls get put on birth control, but because they can't have a baby, they say, well, we don't need to use condoms anymore because I can't get pregnant. However, the condoms are a preventative method for pregnancies, for STDs, to STIs, and all of that type of stuff, which is extremely important as well. But if nobody's having that conversation, then these teenagers are basically like, oh, well, only thing we're concerned about is can we get pregnant? As long as we can't get pregnant, we're okay. And that's not necessarily accurate either. So when I had my daughters, I made a conscious decision as a parent to not put any of my daughters on birth control just because they had a cycle or just because they were teenagers and they were young girls. I decided to do something different and I decided to teach comprehensive sex education to my children. Sex was not a taboo topic in my home. There was never a question that they felt like they couldn't come and ask me. Everything was always on the table. I was always ready for a discussion and I had a discussion with them with no judgment. Meaning, whatever it is that you think you want to know, whatever it is that you think you're into, or whatever you're curious about, there's no judgment. I'm going to answer your questions and I'm not going to demean you. I'm not going to demean your friends. I'm not going to make you feel a way for being human, right? So in my household, that method worked. I did not have to put anyone on birth control. Everybody was, uh, the, the curiosity that most kids had around sex and all of that, my kids didn't have it because... It wasn't taboo in my house. Um, from my knowledge, and I like to put this out there, from my knowledge, when my oldest daughter graduated from high school, she graduated a virgin. All through college, she still maintained her virginity. I know up until 21, and anything after that, she just never decided to discuss it, and that's fine. I have another daughter who's 21 who graduated and chose not to be intimate with anyone. She is in college, still has chosen not to be intimate with anyone. And she's about to be 21 next month on the 6th. I have another daughter who is 16 years old, who also is not sexually active. And I'm not saying that that's a badge of honor. But what I am saying that I do believe that when you practice and preach comprehensive sex education and you give your, your teens and your kids the real information about sex education, a lot of times they will withstand on, 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 on their own. They will, they will basically say, let me look at this from a different perspective. Because what I teach is, I've never told any of my kids not to have sex. My grandmother, the one that was educated, she never told me not to have sex. What she did tell me was, sex is a really big responsibility. And the first thing she let me know was there was a lot that comes along with it. And it can result in babies and STDs and all of this. But the bigger thing that she told me about sex was... Make sure you are ready for it emotionally because a lot of times you have sex when you're young and you're not ready for all of the emotions that come along with it. And I gave my daughters that same message and let them know, look, if you can decide to have sex as a teenager, if that's what you choose to do, but it's a lot of emotions that come along with that. It's a lot of attachments that come along with that. And that's what you really have to make sure that you are ready for. Because I, I don't know about you, but I don't know too many high school boys and I don't know too many college boys that meet young girls and say, you are it. This is it for the rest of my life. I don't see nobody or want nobody but you for the rest of my life. And some young guys do tell lady, young ladies that. And young ladies take that and they hold on to it and believe it. And then when that does not happen, these ladies are completely destroyed and they don't do well in relationships from that point on, even until adulthood. Whereas I'm the type of parent that basically lets my children know that I'm not saying that young men can't be monogamous, but what I am saying is young men that age typically, typically aren't, okay? So um, back to what I was saying about uh, the, the attitudes about sex. So for me growing up, I had a grandmother that was very sex positive. I had one that was very negative and I had a mom that was very realistic. Um, when I got married, I came in it with a lot of different hangups, uh, even though I was married. I had a lot of hangups. There was a lot of body image um, work that I had to do, meaning that I was not necessarily comfortable with my body and the way I developed as an adult. 
uh, there was a lot of shame attached to me being naked, right? I felt like I had to turn off the lights or cover up or not take a shirt off and all of the other childish things that you were taught because nobody really prepared you for these moments in sex when you had to disrobe yourself. No one ever prepares you for this because normally when you are a nude growing up as a teenager, you are alone and this is private. Now you're married, you're in a house with somebody, you're having to share time and space with this person and they're going to have to be able to see you naked as a human. And yet here you are running around covering up because you're shame of your body. Right? And that all comes from a place is basically what I'm telling you. So, we're going to dive deep into our sexual attitudes, why we feel what we feel, and we're going to answer the question, is sex a want or is sex a need? Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs puts sex down there at the bottom layer. Basically, his theory says that sex is just as important as breathing, eating, drinking water, keeping your body at a, a homeostasis, that means a... a the way you're not cold or you don't have a fever, basically keeping your body balanced, right? He said that sex is just as important as that. To keep your body balanced, to breathe, to eat, to drink, all of that. Most people, when I tell them that, they're like, what? Why would sex be equivalent to breathing and eating and all of this kind of stuff? Well, let me tell you, the truth is we were born sexual always have been when we grow up as little kids we're taught take your hand out of your pamper don't touch yourself and we start to pick up on the social cues of the people around us and how they're developing how they're delivering these messages because when they're telling you take your hand out your pamper they're not like oh sweetie take your hand out your pamper they like take your hand out that pamper it's a complete difference in the way that, that is the message is delivered to you. And you know that it's unacceptable, right? Um, if your family catches you masturbating or touching yourself, a lot of times they scold you, right? So you start developing a lot of negative ideas when it comes to sex and you start to sneak and hide. And this is where you get children sneaking and watching people undress or sneaking and watching porn. Or back when I was growing up, sneaking and looking at the magazines. Because you have learned that it's not acceptable. And it's not for children. Even though we are born sexual. We learn early on how to suppress desire. It's not that the desire is not there. The same way the desire is there to eat. The same way the desire is there is to drink. We, we've watched movies where the people kiss and we get all tingly as children. Oh, we've watched movies to where a sex scene came, just depending on your family. If they let you watch it, they made you cover your eyes, right? So what I'm saying is, we've always been sexual. It's just that we've been taught to suppress it. And what happens is, by the time we reach our adolescence years, not only are we taught to suppress it, but now we're taught shame and guilt associated with it. With a touch of religion, let's not, let's not forget that. You're going to go to hell. Okay, so when you put all of that together around sex, that's why people will say, well, why is it considered a need? Because we've been told differently, even though it's something that we naturally do, it's we've been taught differently. And we've been taught to suppress it and we've been taught to be fearful of it. And we've been taught that the consequence of it is going to be eternal life in hell burning. That's what we've been taught. So we would rather suppress it than think about the idea of burning in hell. We, we, and we would rather suppress it than to, to think about the idea of a healthy marriage to where when the, when the, uh, the pastor say, you may kiss your bride, they not hiding trying to do it. See, today a lot of these young people ain't hiding trying to do it. But when I was growing up, you better give a little peck and keep it on going because you don't do all of that other stuff in front of everybody. That's private. Everything is private and everybody tells you to get married, but nobody tells you what to do to prepare for it. They damn sure don't tell you what you need to do in your bedroom. Your family can teach you all the recipes in the kitchen and how to 
cook the best meal and bake the best cake and all of this. They can pass all that knowledge down to you. But when it gets to your bedroom, they have absolutely nothing to say. Other than y'all better try to keep each other happy. And that's the end of the conversation. So, yes, sex is a need. No different than food, water, breathing, and keeping your body balanced with homeostasis. It's no different, right? Monogamous people, I always talk to them because I have to let them know that being that sex is a need and it's equivalent to like food, if you're in a relationship with someone, you have the responsibility to make sure each other eats. I can't get what I need from nobody else. You can't get what you need from nobody else. Meaning that either you're going to feed me or you're going to starve me. And if you choose to starve me, just know that I still have to eat. I just won't eat from you. That means that I'm going to go somewhere and eat. And if you starve me bad enough, I will eat out the trash. You won't like it. Right? So, these are the type of things that we're going to get off into with comprehensive sex education. I hope you all enjoyed my video today. Um, I did a party last night. One thing that I love about uh, when I'm doing parties, uh, it lets me know the need of the people. And the party last night let me know that I need to do a class on how to put a condom on. Because they booked me for a dick sucking class. And they were required to put condoms on the cucumbers. And I'm going to say maybe 70% of the ladies did not know how to put on a condom. On the cucumbers. They didn't know they were rolling it down the wrong way. They uh, had them with big old air bubbles at the tip. So it lets me know what exactly it is that I need to be teaching and what I need to be talking about. So I'm definitely going to have a lesson coming up on how to put on a condom. I'm going to have a lesson on the importance of lubricant. Um, those things are very important because those are just the basic things. And last night's bestseller at the party was the doggy strap. They absolutely love when I use the doggy straps at the parties. Doggy straps help you stay in the perfect position during doggy style. Um, it keeps you from running away. When you get to scooting down to get the flat, your partner can literally just scoops, take you and scoop you and pull you back up. Um, so that was actually my bestseller last night. It is on the website if you would like to order it. We do have them in stock. As you can see, it's that time of year. Y'all already know what it is. I'm a who that girl. Who that is that time of year. Look, I already know. When I go over around here to the house, he's going to probably have a fit when he see me and all this things gear. He already told me I get only one day out the year to rock my Bama gear. So, just for a little history lesson, I have always been an Alabama fan. Ever since Nick left LSU and went to... So, Nick left LSU, went and played for the pros. Left the... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Nick left LSU and went and coached for the pros. After the culture for the pros didn't work out, he went back to Alabama. LSU didn't want him. LSU didn't want him. He went back to Alabama, right? At that moment, I became a Crimson Tide fan. I, the Tide has been rolling with me ever since because I absolutely loved him as a coach. No different than Deion Sanders. When Deion Sanders was at Jackson, Mississippi, I was over there at Jackson. And when Deion left and went to Colorado, guess what? I was in Colorado with Deion too. And wherever Deion decides to go is where I will be going because I like the coaches, right? Right. Well, my man, right, played football for LSU. And he was a part of the championship team. Like, you know, he was a part of when LSU was just, it's, and I'm not saying that they're not thriving now, but they were thriving, thriving. Les Miles was his coach and all of this kind of stuff. So he has a certain feeling about Alabama because he's played Alabama, and that's literally the biggest game of the year and all of this kind of stuff. So he already knew that I was an Alabama fan. And last year, he kind of was, you know, we were still feeling each other out, feeling each other out. And we had um, an LSU versus Alabama party. And, of course, y'all know Bama won or whatever. And, of course, I rubbed it in his face. He, 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 he <laughs> it was too funny. So this year, y'all know I got a lot of Bama gear. He was like, you better pick which shirt you're going. You got one day to wear that Bama gear. Because y'all know during football season, I wear my stuff all year long. So you got one day to wear that Bama gear, which is the LSU Alabama game. So y'all, I got to give me a badass Alabama shirt. And uh, it, Willie on uh, Instagram, what Willie say? Uh, what did he say something about the tag? 
I have to figure, I have to get the, the list saying or whatever. But I, I think I'm going to get that. Uh, oh, I don't give a piss about nothing but the tide. That's what Willis say. I don't give a piss about nothing but the tide. I'm got, I got to get that on my shirt. But, of course, um, we have a difference in teams for professional teams as well. Because he even went and played pro ball for a, sh a very short amount of time. <laughs> he got on the team, and as quick as he got on the team, he got off the team. But, of course, I'm a Saints fan. He's not a Saints fan. Uh, he is a Seahawks fan and a Ravens fan. Um, but more so a Ravens fan. So, I'm, of course, I'm going over with my Saints gear on today. Looking fabulous. Looking fabulous. Because the preseason games have started, and this is my time to get to talk all my shit. So... Y'all, who that, who that, who that? You all be blessed. You all enjoy the rest of your day. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Tell somebody about Sharonda McKnight Parker. Be blessed.